Segway. Segway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm riding. Hold on. Let me get my Segway. Do you want me to pass the torch to? Yes. I don't want to be left hanging. I don't want the torch to go out. You know. Other side. Well, I'm glad you wanted to hear about Banjo Kazooie Spencer. I can't talk to you about that, but I can tell you about oh. how Rare was bought out by Microsoft in 2002, and everything everyone loved about Banjo Kazooie went to shit. <laughs> Many people consider the worst era in Rare history when Microsoft acquired them. The buyout happened in 2002. Microsoft was kind of fresh off launching the Xbox, their first console. And there was sort of a clamor over who would get Rare, who would be acquiring Rare, because Nintendo didn't, they had 50% of the shares at the time of the N64, but they did not commit to put down the other 50%. And Microsoft seized that opportunity to swipe them under the rug and claim them and do great things, promising, wonderful experiences. And it just never really came to fruition. I read an article by Eurogamer, Simon Parkin was the contributor. And this was written in 2012. Who killed Rare? So an inflammatory Ooh. title. But I think at that time, uh, there was some underwhelming aspect to 10 years of Rare. Did Microsoft ruin Britain's greatest game studio? I have some quotes. On the 20th of September 2002, Microsoft paid $375 million for this bonsai tree and all that it symbolized. Creative excellence, technical mastery, innovation, originality, soul, and the precious fingerprints of Nintendo. The fledgling Microsoft Game Studios, desperate to acquire world-class talent that could help establish its game console, saw in that tree everything it desired to become. Ten years later, and Bill Gates is yet to plant a bonsai tree in Rare's once fertile grounds. So, I think that when, at that time, you're looking back at the legacy of what Microsoft had done with Rare, you see that maybe they failed to deliver some promises or um, I guess kind of come off of the N64 era that they were so known and beloved for, even off of country, you could say. Um, this is attributed to several things, especially a workplace culture. Uh, so I got another quote here. There was a gradual introduction of certain Microsoft behaviors that crept into the way we did things. Lots more meetings, performance reviews, and far more regard for your position within the company. The two main uh, rare employees that were interviewed here, I think um, one of their names was like Phil Tallis. I think he was working on Diddy Kong Country and Dinosaur Planet, which became Star Fox Adventures. And then there's another guy, Hollis, who was uh, employed at the um, Killer Instinct time. The way that they described the culture prior to working under Microsoft was that they were working for Tim and Chris Stamper. Mainly, Tim and Chris left us to our own devices. They recognized the talent and left teams to make their game, intervening only when a team was broken or underperforming in their judgment. Nevertheless, they do describe how even working under Tim and Chris was exhausting, but that everybody was more motivated because they felt like they were creating their own products. With Microsoft, there was a lot of like, for the first time we're making, you know, the big games, we're kind of figuring this out together. Um, and I think that they felt while working with Nintendo that Nintendo had a bit more, I guess, uh, expertise in the field. They had done it many times. And also, I guess if you look at the history going from uh, Ultimate play the game the game got it uh you had seen that kind of like independence and also expertise and then since they joined microsoft microsoft had their own ambitions things that they were hoping to accomplish rare was considered kind of a bad match because rare always kind of leaned into that more uh charismatic cartoonish style that nintendo was kind of known and loved for the kind of like kid crowd and so you had kind of a mismatch you know they said that the bride is beautiful and the groom is beautiful but together they both want to go in different directions the problem here was that rare was a very long way from the very corporate structure of microsoft and when rare had made games it wasn't in isolation from nintendo but as a creative partnership 
So at that time, 2012, it's been 10 years now since then. So, I mean, we can look back and see that Rare kind of still hasn't done a lot. But it's very interesting to see that, like, that sentiment was so strong at the time, killed Rare, the death of Rare, that they accomplished nothing since that time. I think they did their own thing and that you can still see games with, you know, hints of talent. And they kind of allude to that at the end of the article. But the general consensus is that the Microsoft era rare is not the rare of old. And a bit of a sad sight to see. That's my it would review. Be, it would be interesting to look at the the history of some of the bigger names to see when they may have left uh, the company. Like the I, th- I believe the Stampers left during Perfect Dark Zero, if I'm not wrong. Oh shit, that's that quickly. I th- no, I might be wrong about that. It was either that or Via Pinata. I think Via Pinata might might actually be it. Well, it good. says in in my article it says Tim found a smart form, smartphone game studio with his son called Fortune Fish. So I can yeah. look up on that. Was I have that actually? They did an interview and with a. Uh, with Tim Stamper, not them, not the Eurogamer people. I had another one from Nintendo Life. They just didn't have a lot. Rare co-founder has no idea why Nintendo didn't buy the studio outright. Apparently, I think Activision was the other company that was vying for acquiring Rare. <laughs> oh, God. It didn't happen. Uh, Microsoft did instead. Um, Microsoft was really like pushing for like just acquiring the top talents. So you got to remember, this is like one year after the Xbox. So they're just trying to acquire as many IPs as possible. And a lot of people view that era as like, oh, they acquired them and then just did nothing with them. And so uh, there, I, but there's also that interest of like Nintendo didn't really see much of a future in them. Stamper is at a loss as to why Nintendo didn't step in and open up his checkbook. I have no idea why they didn't do that. I thought we were a good fit. But he does say that the price of software development was going up with platforms and uh, Rare works really well with a partner. We were looking for someone. And then he says he liked Microsoft at the time. Well, the thing is that Nintendo is known for making stupid decisions anyway. But um, I believe Nintendo actually, I don't don't think they had exactly 50. I I, I think they had closer to like 49% share. So I believe Nintendo had 49 yeah, because that's how Microsoft stepped in and bought the other 51 and scooped it all up. Um, so, but yeah, they were... Uh, <laughs> they, I mean, they, they've been second party since, what, like the NES? Because I remember like the NES, um, one of their earlier games, uh, I, don't, I wish I could tell you which one it was, um, they showed them... Uh, a demo of the game and Nintendo was like blown away by what they were able to do on the NES. Um, and yeah, they, they've been, they work close together since then. So it is really surprising that like Nintendo didn't jump at the chance, but again, it's Nintendo and they make some dumb choices sometimes. I bet they were like, yeah, we can just, we could do better than that. Yeah, they kind of were. <laughs> I do want to correct you, though. So it does say in 1993 it was 49% share that uh, Nintendo okay. had purchased. But in um, it was a couple of years later when people from Rare reached out to explain what their situation was. They were 50% owned by Nintendo, and Nintendo had an option to acquire oh, okay. the other half if, by a certain date. If they didn't exercise that option, Rare had the option to find a buyer for Nintendo's half. So oh, that's what that was, sta- okay. the stampers that were that looking for potential buyers, and then Microsoft stepped up to the plate. I think, like, well, that would, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that would explain why they didn't, they didn't buy it, because maybe they didn't seem deem it like worth all the money that it would take to acquire the rest of it. They said they felt that the would make- decision was necessary, too. If you look at the N64, they're actually explaining in one of the articles. I don't know if it was the Stampers or the Hollis or the whatever. Um, but they're saying, like, the N64 was viewed as kind of a like a commercial failure, and the GameCube was, like, even worse. So, like, it was, like, the Xbox is, like, new hot stuff. Chris and I mm-hmm. needed to take a new direction to produce some better, greater products for the future. And we thought the only way we'd be able to do that was to take a step sideways and pursue a new venture. They left in 2007, by the way. So I was, yeah, so it was right. It must have been right yeah. after uh, Via Pinata then. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense, too. And Nintendo, this is kind of a dickbag move, but <laughs> it also worked out, I think, for them, is that their biggest success 
aside from Banjo Kazooie, I, I don't necessarily know the numbers, but their business, their biggest success was with the Nintendo franchise. And so it's like, well, we don't need Rare to make that because we already ha- we still have it. So I guess we're losing Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> so, so, well, and it sounds jerk. to me, you know, it's easy. It's easy to like to be like, well, Rare has sucked since the buyout. But I, I honestly, with the way you're describing the work environment, I mean, it's. I think it's mostly the blame for for Microsoft. It's it's. It sounds like they, they, they opened the the doors and you know and you know and they were obviously obviously having a new console. You're gonna want names to draw people in and have you know games and stuff. Makes sense. The Xbox is basically you know a, the the more powerful GameCube and PS2. I mean, a freedom for its time stuff. So you're gonna draw this big studio in, buy them out, and then instead of letting them make their games, it sounded like they were like, okay, well, we're doing it this way. And just kind of stepped on everything Rare was <laughs> used to doing. <laughs> um, which it was, makes no sense. Like, why would you... You have a brand new console, you don't know what you're doing, and you're going <laughs> to come in and tell the studio that's been making gold for the last 10 years <laughs> to <laughs> do things your way. <laughs> I, I think I can see what Microsoft was trying to do with Rare was to appeal, like get the young gamers mm-hmm. to get into Microsoft for a couple of reasons. You can get the, the parents to buy in, to be like, oh, there are kitty games for it, so do that. And then also to get that like early install base so that you know kids could say they grew up with Microsoft and then you get the 360 and you, know, you have an install base there. But yeah, it seems like they didn't really handle Rare very well, so that all those games were trash. And it was like, oh, <laughs> not good. Well, so the two know. games they made for Xbox weren't awful. It's just the fact that like they they could have done way better and they could have done more. Yeah. You know, the same thing happened with um, kind of off subject with with you know with the, the, uh, the original Xbox. Same thing happened with uh, Odd World and uh, Lauren Landing and Odd World Inhabitants. Um, you know, they were on PS1, and then they brought them over to Xbox, and Microsoft helped with, I think, much as Odyssey, and just nothing. Nobody cared. They had the it was just the wrong audience for that for that that series. Yeah, I think yeah, I there's mean, a lot yeah. of missteps in looking at just what was the Microsoft work culture with Rare. Um, so I have some quotes here. I just want to pick some good ones. Um. One of the biggest changes was the freedom to talk about projects that you weren't working on. So you had mentioned the black light. I don't know if that's the phrase you use, but where they're not allowed to talk about uh, it. Uh, blackout. Blackout. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the like media blackout. Yeah. So this seems like a good thing. We were allowed to use the internet during working hours, allowed to listen to music. So a lot of the early changes were positive to morale. However, in time, it became clear that everyone had underestimated how much of the studio's success was down to Nintendo's gentle steering. It's almost like Microsoft is just like, okay, go. And they didn't even know what they're doing. Cause they, you know, they're still trying to figure out what are the big hits. They wanted hit games for their console since they weren't sure how to go about it. They trusted rare to do what was necessary. The problem here was that rare was a very long way from the very corporate structure of Microsoft. And when rare had made games, it wasn't in isolation from Nintendo, but as a creative partnership. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just kind of like, Microsoft was like, yeah, we got them. We got the best guys in the business. They'll know what to do. All right, go. <laughs> Cameo. That's, that's, <laughs> I, that sounds very true. And also, I think also like once the Stampers leave in 2007, I think that's like, that's just a, they're, they're done after that. Because that they, they drove so much of that company. I remember reading about um, the development of GoldenEye and how Nintendo pulled backing for that for a while because they didn't have faith in it mm. and the stampers never told the team the the team like the like like the stampers were paying the team but they were getting no funding from uh, from nintendo f- uh, during that time for for the, the, the development of goldeneye and the stampers were like we have faith in this product so we're just gonna let them make it and we're just gonna pretend like everything's okay <laughs> 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 and, and 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 honestly like i think once the stampers leave it's just like a, it's a sign of like things to come for the studio yeah Three i think it's demoralizing right because those guys were there since what the like er, the founding right yeah, yeah, yeah. They they founded the company, and I think 
maybe I don't know. <laughs> I, it's just like without their leadership, maybe the that that, that could be also why Rare just kind of fell apart. I still don't think some of those Xbox and 360 games were awful. Don't you know? I think they had some cool stuff, but mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think it wasn't Cameo like decent. Yeah, we'll Cameo was rushed. Tomorrow. <laughs> It wasn't bad, but it was rushed. Um, and then Perfect Dark Zero is... I didn't rushed. play it, so I'm not going to say much. <laughs> those, those two were those two were very rushed for a 360 release in 2005. Like, you know, for the console release. Yeah. Um, I think you have another issue here. This is interesting to me. The other staffing change was the introduction of a producer role. Da-da-da-da. Pro- producers were a new thing to Rare. It wasn't a role that was instantly understood. And each project had a Rare producer and a Microsoft producer one either side of the Atlantic. So, you know, it's interesting to me that like they're having, you know, like, cause I think the thing that stands out to me is like, oh, there's like a corporate culture. There's meetings every week they're talking about. It. And I, when I think of rare, I don't think of that. I think of them drinking beers and like cracking jokes and then writing into <laughs> the script for like banjo. And then it's like, you want to re- like remove all of that and just like do a solid tried and true approach. And then you've got two conflicting roles. That's how like having two bosses that are like have different, uh, you know, needs. And then suddenly that stress is going down to your employees. It just sounds like a bad workplace. Um, yeah. I think they managed okay, all things considered, but... You know, I think you see some missteps due to that. I think, and like the whole thing with with Nintendo is, I don't think Nintendo ever got got too involved. They just kind of were like, "You should maybe do this way" or something, you know. But I don't think they ever had like a Nintendo producer on hand. Like, like I think like in the like Star Fox Adventure, which is arguably one of their worst games, was the only one that like like Miyamoto was like, "Yeah, change it," and then they, it was worse uh, than what they probably could could have made. Um, but. Nintendo, you know, no, 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 I'm not going to let you say, Nintendo has never stepped into a Star Fox game and actively made it worse. How dude, dare you I do not want to talk about Star Fox right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to open the Star Fox paradox where <laughs> if Nintendo tries something different, it's fucking hated. And if Nintendo does the same thing again, it's fucking hated. So I don't want to talk about Star Fox right now. Um, but anyway, but like even even at that time, it seemed like Rare still had a little bit of that like freedom you were talking about, Teddy. Where like they, because like I remember like the uh, the development of the Conquerors Twelve Tales before it was um, Bad Fur Day. Uh, Twelve Tales, they thought you know, after a while that the the team thought it felt too close to Banjo and Mario sixty four and stuff. And then w- one of the guys, he wasn't even like lead on the team or anything. He just was like, "Hey, why don't we just change it?" to this this more crude game and then the Stanford brothers were like okay well you you're in charge then you you make it <laughs> so <laughs> you know so it's just like the guy just had an idea they're like okay well you do it then and then yeah bad fur day happened and it's i don't know if that if that kind of freedom would, would be under like that sort of environment where like you have a microsoft producer and a rare producer they did make nuts and bolts yeah, and that's actually kind of the glimmer <laughs> and hope uh, at the end of this article here, which is very interesting here. Um, it's difficult to square this positivity with the reality versus current output. Da, 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 da. Um, my seven-year-old son woke me up a couple mornings ago because he couldn't find Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. As you might imagine, he has lots of games to choose from, but that's the one he wanted to play, that game of all games. It says to me there's still some magic left at Rare. So we like to, I like to shit on nuts and bolts. Honestly, though, I mean, I've put more time into it. It's an homage. I can respect it as that. And so, I mean, it is nice to acknowledge that, like, okay, we didn't just, like, you know, because if you just play the first five minutes of that game, it's like, this is insulting. This is terrible. This is not the banjo I know and love. What the hell is, why are there carts? You know, um, banjo pilot. But uh, I think... Um, seeing it here even acknowledged by like the creator's son that he's having fun with the game alex talks about how he's put a lot of time into the game you know you can really invest yourself into it that there is still some fun it's not just like the game's not just like a fable 3 fable 3 is disgusting you know and i played that <laughs> game start to finish so i don't know yeah fable 3 is disgusting um it well and nuts of bolts is sad as well because that was like the game you can obviously tell if you play it that the team put a lot of like love and care into what they made like they had faith in that project mm-hmm. and it did not sell 
nearly as well as they were hoping yeah. and that was like the last straw with microsoft after that they were like okay well you're making connect games for a bit and then they just got them on that and they did like connect sports and shit and it was kind of like a sad time they didn't they didn't create another original idea or game until sea of thieves you know like that was yeah it was sad so uh like like nuts and bolts is like for me it's like the only game out of that well, maybe via Pinata, but those are like the only games out of that later library that like just feel like maybe look more of an authentic rare experience. But at the same time, I don't think it's right for the Xbox crowd. And I think Microsoft realized that. Yeah. Bad partnership, you know, good company, yeah. good games or good ideas, you know, just wrong platform, maybe. Can you imagine Banjo-Kazooie and Nuts and Bolts on GameCube? That'd probably be a hit. I don't think it would have been nuts and bolts. It, it would have been a, a platformer game, probably. Banjo Three was eluded. Yeah, yeah. So, so didn't they make Banjo Three? Wasn't that uh, ukulele? Isn't that pilot? Isn't that pilot? Like Grunty's was revenge. that Grunty takes a shower? Yeah. <laughs> they, no, there there is there is hope on the horizon though. Okay, see if these is not awful. It's a fun game. For what it is, um, Spencer, shut up. Ranking next um, week Monday. You know they they worked on the Battletoads reboot. That's neat, um, and there is hope. I I think Everwild is looking cool, and you know we haven't seen too too you know too much of it yet. But I think what I've seen, I, I like, and uh, I want to know um, where it's going to go. And also, we we sort of seen Microsoft do a cool thing where they take these rare IPs and. Instead of just leaving them with rare, they give them the people that maybe could do some more, you know, do better <laughs> with them now. Like the Killer Instinct series is, you know, that was a big launch title for the Xbox One, um, and that's a different developer. Um, rare teamed up with a, with a different developer for Battletoads reboot, and then next year it's still slated for next year. We'll see what happens, but next year we're, we're supposed to get more info and and a release date for Perfect Dark, which is not by Rare. And if you even want to take the Platonic Games route, Demon Turf is supposedly yeah, pretty true. good. <laughs> Just saying. Spencer, you look distraught. Spencer, what, what, what are you going to say about Killer Instinct? No, no, it's, I, it's just a, what you said about <laughs> Microsoft's strategy with Rare Games is, is a little bad. them away from Rare. Yeah, yeah, it's it's what, true though. I mean, I like that story. Here's they've been doing better with it. Here's an idea: What if we bought a company that makes really good games, mm-hmm. gutted them, <laughs> found out they can't I'm make any saying, good games no, no, somehow, no, no. I'm and then gave this, those games to other I'm, companies? I'm saying at this point, at this point where we're at now, Rare is making their game, Sea of Thieves, Everwild, and stuff. That's cool. Rare's doing their own thing now. They're yeah. taking the properties that Rare isn't <laughs> using and giving them to other people. That rare did use, and make very you know. It's not it took yeah. twenty years, but I think we're onto something. We might get a return what? investment. Invest while we're I'm low. I'm just saying, like I'm just sore. happy. Like they're at this point, they're they're. It seems like they're making the best out of a bad situation. That is a very positive way to look at it, and I admire that. Very good, Alex. <laughs> 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 Killer Instinct is a cool game on the Xbox One. <laughs> Ranking <Whatever>. coming soon. <laughs> hey y'all, don't forget to subscribe to them button mappers.